So this is the Big Friendly Swim Podcast, and today I get to sit down and talk to you. I get to sit down and talk to Caitlin Sandino. Um, so for those who might not know you, who maybe haven't heard your name before, can you introduce yourself and walk through some of your history with swimming? Yeah, definitely. Um, I competed in the 2000 and the 2004 Olympic Games. I have one gold, one silver, and two bronze medals amongst the two games. Um, I was on the relay that broke the world, uh, the world record in the 4 by 200 freestyle relay. I was the anchor on that, and Natalie Calgan um, got us off to an incredible start, and we broke the oldest world record in the history books, and that was in 2004. Um, I would say, you know, my strengths were 2 a.m. Uh, sorry, 4 a.m. to fly, 4 free. Um, and then later in my career, I started to try to be a 200 IMR. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was my wishful thinking as I said that. So yeah, I've known for kind of the long, grueling events. Um, I swam at my first Olympics when I was still in high school. and my second Olympics, I was going into my senior year at USC. And I finished um, my swimming career at the University of Michigan with the postgrad team, Club Wolverine with Bob Bowman and some guy you never heard of, Michael Phelps. <laughs> uh, I don't know who that is. No. Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to I want to talk about making the Olympics at seventeen because we've seen a lot of athletes shine at a young age like Missy Franklin, Reagan Smith, a lot of especially in the past couple of years a lot of younger athletes, and it sort of makes your name like a household name like everybody <laughs> knows who you are. But you've spoken openly a lot about the pressure that you felt and especially in that first race at the Olympics the pressure right then. So there was three different races that you did at that first Olympics in Sydney 2000. Could you talk about the different emotions and the different feelings after each one of them? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I feel like the pressure now is even so much more because of the existence of social media. So luckily I didn't have that, especially in 2000, but I, you know, I did feel, um, it was the first time I really felt pressure in my swimming career in general. I feel like in, in for, for the most part of my swimming career, I just loved to race. I got out there and I did the best I can. But when I got to Sydney, Australia, you know, swimming is the biggest sport that they have out there. And all eyes are on us, ton of paparazzi, ton of media. Um, and something that I had never experienced before was hearing that people bet on Olympic racing, like who's <laughs> going to win. And, you know, when people are like, show me, what is it even called, the odds? I don't, I'm so yeah. bad with that kind of stuff. When people are like, you're, you know, you're, you're favored to win um, a medal in the 4 a.m. And, and you're getting, you know, people voting or betting on you to win gold. And that like really seeped into my head, like, wait, what? This is crazy. Um, I'm 17 years old. This is my, you know, first major um, <clears throat> appearance on a stage this large. And um, I think, you know, that really got me out of my element as far as how comfortable and confident I usually always was behind the block. Um, nothing really shook me too much. But when I walked out there for the finals of the 400 IM on that first day, my first ever Olympic uh, finals race, um, it was like an, it was an out of body experience. Like my legs felt like jello. Um, you know, I felt like I, I felt really competitive and I, I almost like that's what backfired. Like I went out, I swam somebody else's race and I didn't stay in my own lane and I didn't do what I, I didn't swim the 400 I am how I normally swim the 400 I am. Um, so it was definitely a learning experience right then and there. And I, I realized a lot of um, things that I needed to manage my emotions better and to stay in my own lane better and not to worry about other people and, and just swim it the way that Caitlin Sandino normally swims it. Um, what I've always practiced and what my coach's game plan was with me. So um, definitely learned a lot after, after, after that first race. Um, was really disappointed I didn't go best time was crushed that I didn't medal, um, but it was a very eye-opening experience and one that um, really shaped the way I, I took on events moving forward. From um, there forward, I just you know gave myself the goal to just always aim to go best time, no matter what color the medal turns out at the end, or even if I do medal, just always go for my personal best. So my mentality really shifted, and um, the next race I had was a 200 butterfly, and um, I got sixth. Uh, but it was the best time, so I had to celebrate. But it was really <laughs> incredible just to be in that race because that was the race that Misty Hyman upset the Madam Butterfly of Australia. <laughs> and just to be a part of that um, whole teammate experience, and our, our team was going crazy, and we're you know people were breaking barriers trying to give her a big hug, and that was just an iconic race just to be a, just to be a teammate in. And then my final race is the 800 freestyle. And I was like, all right, as much as I'm saying I don't care about the medals, I really want to come home with one. <laughs> um, so I just kind of just push everything out. I'm like, just get your hand on the wall. And 
again, I, I figured if I win a best time, it could medal. So it was like one of those things, go best time and you should see a medal. But um, stick, uh, that's a race I really did stick to my game plan because I really did try to always kind of try to negative split or back half those races and um, just really hung in there and got my hand on the wall for a bronze. And then that, you know, that first taste of the Olympics is what really made me want to get back for more. I mean, once you experience something like that, it's still pretty hard for me to find the right words for it. Um, but once once I got a taste of the Olympic Games, I'm like, okay, how can I get back here and do it again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember I uh, my old club team had a swim clinic with Caitlin Leverins. Yeah. And she was talking about that 200 fly final in 2000 and she was watching it on TV. Okay. And how that kind of like inspired her and she wanted cool. to go to the Olympics after that. So yeah. I, that, that's a pretty legendary race. It was really amazing to be a part of it and just like how the crowd reacted and um, just more like it was so, it was a really turning point for Team USA. I, you could just feel all the energy and she just like really like pumped everybody up for their own races. Um, and like I said, it was just one of the coolest experiences I've had as a teammate before. So um, after reading about your involvement with the Jesse Reese Foundation in this book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd love to hear from you any stories that you're comfortable sharing about any experiences that you had with what is easily one of the most wonderful nonprofit groups out there. Thank you. Oh man, there's so many, cause, um, I've had so many amazing encounters. Every, every visit I'd walk away with just very impactful, um, very meaningful, uh, it's sincere memories, um, doing over, gosh, I think around 170 visits. It's surreal. It truly is. I mean, the things that really resonated the most with me or really hit me the most was more of the comments from the parents um, because what they're seeing their child go through and knowing what their demeanor has been like, you know, before we we're in the room, after we we're in the room, you know. So the, the feedback we get a lot was like, thank you so much for coming and visit. You know, I haven't seen my daughter smile in three months. You know, or, or thank you so much for coming in today with, we used, uh, we had some big like football guys in there too. Like when we were <laughs> in Pittsburgh, we brought in some Pittsburgh Steelers and, you know, older boys that, you know, 16, 17 years old sitting in a hospital bed all day. And um, I remember we walked in there with two um, Pittsburgh Steeler, like big names. And, you know, the, the, this patient just completely lit up and he sat up and he was chatty, <laughs> chatting. He asked to try on the Super Bowl rings and asked to take pictures. And I, I swear we could have stayed in there all day. And when we left, the mom texted one of the nurses and was like, I can't even begin to tell you what that did for his morale. You know, he hardly has smiled, laughed, engaged since we've been here. And it had been like close to like half of a year. And the nurse is like, you guys don't, I don't know if you understand like what this does for not just the patient, but then the whole family, right? Like when the parents finally get to see their kids smile or laugh or engage with others. Um, so knowing that it's um, an impact that you know, ripples amongst the whole family. Um, those are the stories that I just, you know, really resonate so much with um, just my experiences. And it just solidifies what the Jesse Reese Foundation does, right? The whole cause is to spread hope, joy, and love to children fighting cancer and to encourage them to never, ever give up. So when we get those feedbacks like that, we had laughter in the room, there was joy in the room, like, okay, we're doing what we're set out to do. That sounds awesome, honestly. Like, I... It's really nice to hear it from you, like, face-to-face, because -face, I, I was reading about it, and it just, it almost, like, brought a tear to my eyes when I was reading it. Like, I was sitting there, like, am I crying <laughs> over a book right now? No, it was, it was just awesome to hear about it. I, I love the work that you guys do. Thank you so much. It means a lot. It's been so hard ever since COVID. I mean... We haven't been able to get back into the hospital visits, but um, you know we're we're still making a difference. We're still sending joy jars. We're still you know doing Jesse's mission. But on a personal level, I haven't been able to get into the hospital since um, prior to um, uh, COVID. So it's been very challenging to be like, okay, well, what can I do now? You know, so we donate monthly and we go to different events for them and and whatnot. But I'm just I would really like to get back into the hospital visits. Do you, Do you know when you guys would be able to do that? No, I really don't. I mean, I feel like everybody's still trying to figure out how to navigate these waters. Yeah. yeah. It, f it feels like every time we're like entering a better phase of COVID, another 
something. Another wave hits, another, yeah. something else happens. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just like, hey, we always have to put the patient's safety first. Yeah. And, you know, I totally, I understand 100%, I mean, obviously, but um, so Have you guys thought about doing like Zoom calls? We've done those. We did those during the holidays too. That was really cool as well. Nice. And um, yeah, that's it is something that I know that a lot of hospitals have been syncing up. I know the Ryan C. Caress Foundation has been doing ways to do that. I do one of those. So yeah, you have to get clever and creative in these times. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, since we're since we're talking about a lot of stuff that you've done post swimming career, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Perfect. So I'm I'm curious if you can talk about the ISL because in 2019 it officially started. Yeah. And you were one of the you were the general manager for the DC Trident. So what was it like coming back to professional swimming in a capacity that really had never been done before? I'm I'm curious what you can say about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, a lot of different emotions and different feedback and insight. Um, as a former swimmer, uh, truly special and iconic to be able to elevate the sport. You know, swimming is really popular every four years at the Olympics and then it disappears. Like we're not even swimming but you know every summer there's yeah. a really incredible swim meet and usually in in winter you know there's so many other opportunities to watch incredible swimming but more the financial aspect of it and you know obviously that's um the sensitive topic with isl that you know in the end it was the finances that have been you know so challenging um it's a, it's a challenging sport to get sponsors for and it was a challenging time to start a startup international swimming league, you know, first season I thought was a success. And then the second season, boom, COVID. Um, but I have to applaud and say, Hey, you know, we made it to, um, season two in COVID, you know, we were one of the only professional sports that I think successfully handled. Um, you know, we were supposed to six weeks in Budapest. Yeah. And I thought the league did phenomenal with it. I think it was, um, something that all, all of our athletes really needed. You know, a lot of people declined it. Obviously, people were afraid and worried, and they, they had to do what was good for them. But the athletes that were there, they got to train together. They got to race together. They got to have community and camaraderie and, and you know, go through – these challenges as athletes that everybody that have been ex experiencing and doing it together, doing it as a team, doing it as, you know, as a community. And I think that's what people really needed during COVID because community didn't really exist. Um, you know, so ISL as GM was very challenging. You know, it was very interesting waters to navigate, um, but I learned a lot and anything, the relationships that I developed with our current athletes were priceless. Um, I was really proud of the staff that I put together um, all three years and especially my last staff. I just feel like we had just an incredible um, just diversity and experience and we just had all the parts that we needed to, you know, to fire so well. And I think it showed with our team, too. We swam incredible. It was our best season to date. Yeah. Um, so it, it was it was sad to step away from it. And it's sad to see this this state that it's in right now. I don't know if they'll be able to recover. I really hope they can. Um, and I would love to come back too. You know, I just had to be selfish and step back and just know that it was um, not what was working in my life personally. Um, and I, I was um, I was really proud of what I built with DC Trident and the culture that we established. And I met incredible athletes and, and staff. And I like, this is my first fall. I haven't been in Europe in three years and I'm sad. Like I have like flashbacks and, and whatnot, but I'm just at a, you know, a different stage of my life right now. So I am really grateful for the experience that I had with ISL, the, the highs, the lows and everything in between. I, uh, I know you're talking about like how much it helped the athletes who were there and I can speak personally. It helped the people who were watching too. Oh, like I, I was, I was staying up at like 5 AM just sitting uh, in my room watching because I fan. didn't have anything to do. Right? Like I, it, it, oh. it, honestly, it kept me sane. Oh wow! Like Gosh. it was, it was awesome. And then Thank it carried you. over. Oh yeah, no, That's definitely me. like. And then it carried me over into my college season because our college season was kind of the same deal. It was like none of us really want to mess this up. Right. <laughs> we 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 got to we got to compete and it didn't actually impact our eligibility, which was awesome. Okay. So it was just. It was a similar situation of, I saw how well the ISL handled it, and I'm like, all right, time to time to do the same thing on a, on a much smaller level, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. That's that's um, it's encouraging, definitely. That yeah. it, people felt you know felt it. So um, we're we're gonna we're gonna jump back in time a little bit here. We're we're jumping around the years. I love it. That's how I talk <laughs> to people all over the place. <laughs> 
So, um, in your book, Golden Glow, fantastic book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, you, we're gonna get a little bit more serious, I guess, here. You, you okay. talked about a really unfortunate accident that you and your teammate, Cammie Miller, went through, and somehow, you guys managed to come back three days later and achieve All-American status at NCAAs. Like, that's, that's just, that's amazing. Oh, that you. shows, like, like, the tenacity and the perseverance that you both had. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you can just walk me through that week. What were the emotions that you went through and like, how did you handle the pressure of needing to compete like three days later? Uh, wow. Um, so I had never been in a car accident before. And, um, to this day, that was been the only car accident I've been in. And it was scary. It was terrifying. You know, um, it was on a very busy freeway in LA. Um, a lot of motion. Honestly, when we first stopped, it was like, like, are you okay? Are you okay? And like my ears were ringing. It was just like, it was um, discombobulating, you know, and um, just like, almost like a state of shock. Like, what do I do first? Who I call first? Like, I open the door and there's like liquids on the floor. Like, are you bleeding? Am I bleeding? Like, what is, you know, what's going on? And um, I feel like we almost just kind of kicked into like survival mode, like, you know, got on the phone, made the right phone calls. Um, I swear my parents drove up there like in a heartbeat and somehow they were there in a second and called our coach, Mark Schubert. And it was like, that was a whirlwind. And then, um, you know, I think it's, I was like so disappointed how my freshman year went at SC, just like with the injuries and coming off of, you know, being a top recruit in the nation and just not really being able to, I feel like swim to, to my potential that year. And, you know, sophomore year, I was like, okay, this is going to be my year, but I, you know, I was still recovering from injury. And um, I just, was really struggling with like the love for this sport and I was like okay you know things started kind of clicking by the end of sophomore season and I was like I think I can pull this together to you know so much better than last year and then when this accident happened I'm like you've got to be kidding me you know and and it was just like I think you know when I touched on it about the Olympic Games when I did something once you when you've experienced something once so amazing and so surreal you just want to get back there and so you know just the the almost mental stubbornness being like, no, this is not going to, you know, hold me down. And, you know, what do the doctors know? Like I can get out there and I can race. And, um, you know, only, you know, you, and only, you know, yourself as an athlete, as a competitor, um, know your body. Um, so, you know, I just think it was a commitment that I had made to my school, to my team, to my teammates, um, and just to myself, like, I didn't want to like go through a whole nother season of, you know, working my butt off and then be like, oh, JK, I can't swim. You know, like that's like why I train to race and to race the best and to make it to that level of competition. So um, I think probably just mental stubbornness and um, dedication and, and just being driven or inspired to try to get back to um, my potential. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. It, um, Obviously, different situations, but I've heard a lot of stories of athletes talking about coming back from injuries or coming back from yeah. traumatic events, and there's always a lot of, I guess, I guess impatience is the best word that yeah, I can think of. That's a good. One. Yeah, yeah I'm impatient. Like, like heal already. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I had a shoulder injury last year where I was basically stuck kicking for like two weeks. Oh, the worst. <laughs> and I was just, I was losing my mind. Yeah, and it's again completely different scenario, but like the <laughs> the impatience of wanting to just fast forward to when you're recovered and feeling better again. Um. So, it, so additionally, b building off of that, what was what was some of the support like at USC after that? Oh wow, um, USC. I mean, it was incredible. The support was there. Um, honestly, like my head coach Mark Schubert. He never gave up on me. Um, he didn't let me give up on myself, which I think is really important. There was plenty of times where I'm like, oh, just throw in the towel already. Uh, and then honestly, like not not related to USC, but my parents. I mean, my parents were just there left and right if I needed them to come with me to a doctor's appointment um, just to help me, you know, try to because when I was first hurt my freshman year, nobody knew what was wrong with me. I had this like excruciating pain in my back and it took my breath away. It hurt to breathe, hurt to cry. Like I hurt to like yawn. And it was like, what? and nobody knew what was wrong with me. And I was like, this is so, that was like even more frustrating than the pain itself. It's like, is this like a phantom injury, right? And so my parents were just there with me through it all. And I had to go through some painful tests too. 
And, you know, they were just right there and they would, you know, be there when I needed them and um, were my sounding board in my support system. And, you know, I, I see usually the team stays there during the summer. My freshman year, I had to go home and work with the physical therapist in Orange County and um, just try to heal. And you know, living with my parents was amazing. The support was amazing and um, really couldn't have made it through that time without them. But USC, definitely so supportive. Um being in LA, just having such great medical experts in the area, um, even though it was kind of hard to get diagnosed, it finally <laughs> was. And um, just having this, this, the you know the, the medical staff at USC, just you know a hop, skip, and a walk away from the pool too, was um, pretty tremendous in, in, in the recovery process. But um, I also had an amazing physical therapist in Orange County that um, honestly like would give up his lunch breaks to take me to the pool, and we'd start with like a 200 or like a 50, and we would just make it up from there. His name's Nick Theaters and he was instrumental um, in my recovery as well. So luckily, and, and I was just so grateful for the people I was surrounded by and people that were rooting for me, you know, people that believed in me and knew that I wasn't done yet. Yeah. So speaking of not being done yet, <laughs> a, about a year after that, you made a return to the Olympics <laughs> and you, you've won over a dozen international medals and you've, in, in, your, in your book, you talked about how special that 400 IM was. And honestly, I would kill to drop six seconds in a race right now. That would be amazing. Like, <laughs> so can you, can you talk about that race and that Olympics as a whole? Like, what was it like coming back? Yeah. The first Olympics you went to, you were the, you were the new, you were the new girl. You were the, the newbie. Yeah, yeah, the newbie. And then the second time around, this time you were a veteran. You, yeah. you'd made it back. You were the, I guess, like, somebody who could lead the next generation of athletes who are at their first Olympics. I, honestly, I think because of all the injuries that I had between 2000 and 2004 and the illnesses and just not being at my best, um, you know, physically I healed. Mentally, I felt like I had to heal because I had, like, this new, um, like, a um, self-doubt started creeping into my head. And I was never that type of swimmer before, but I think when you go through, like, such traumatic injuries and – you just like, you start doubting yourself. Like I'll never get better. Will I ever be as fast as I ever was? And so when I finally healed physically and mentally, I had this new regain. Like I, was, I just like was grateful to be swimming again and enjoyed swimming again. And I was just so happy to be swimming again. So I feel like, you know, in 2000, I probably walked into the Olympics being nervous. Um, be, even before I knew I was, you know, I think in the back of my head, it was, it was coming out. And then obviously before that 400 IM, I was definitely nervous. But in 2004, I was just having fun, and I was so grateful to be there. And, you know, literally my only goal going into those Olympics was, you know, to enjoy every moment and then to break for 40 and the 400 I am. Um, and I knew I was having fun, and I think I, I know that other people saw it too. I'll never forget that Eddie Reese uh, came up to me, you know, a legendary coach, and he had seen me through all my career, and he's like, you know, Caitlin, you just look like a different swimmer out there. And I was like, oh, really? Like, I feel like my strokes look pretty similar, and, <laughs> you know, I feel like my body type is pretty similar. He's like, I'm like, well, what do you think it is? He's like, you just look like you're having so much fun. You're having fun again. And I was like, oh, there it is, Eddie. There it is. Like, <laughs> Yes, he knows a thing right? or two. Yeah, he knows a thing or two. And so that's what it was, you know, and I just think it's, 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 it's like almost like that, that, that mm -hmm. advice that's so obvious you're going to think so it's really helpful, but it's like, just have fun and enjoy it. And that's what I tried to pass on to this generation. And when I still, you know, get to reconnect with athletes that are still similar right now, like it goes it, while you're grinding and while you're training, it doesn't feel like it's going to be over in a blink. <laughs> it feels like the longest days ever. But then, you know, when you're removed from the sport, you're like, wow, that really, that really was only like this much of my life. And, you know, even now I'm like, oh, I wish I would have enjoyed that more or taken it in more or, you know, my last kind of year so, I mean, I really didn't enjoy it. And I'm, I'm pretty bummed about that. You know, I wish I would have just stayed in that moment and known how cool it was that, you know, I was living as a professional athlete. Um, Cause now when you're working in the real world, you're like, wow, I could have <laughs> done that a little bit longer. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, when I got to the 04, honestly, my goal was just to break 440. And um, I was going up against Yana Klechkova, who is the defending world record uh, champion, Olympic champion. And she smoked me in 2000. And <laughs> I just wanted to be like closer to her, but honestly, I just wanted to break 440. And, um, you know, we just got on these epic duels that just, you know, the expression like iron sharpens iron and just having her next to me, pushing me. Um, and she was just dangling that carrot in front of me. I'm like, do not let her get away from you. Um, and then just battling it out to the very, very end. And 
you know, I touched and I got silver by 12 one hundredths of a second to her. And I was like, okay, well, you know, four years ago, she beat me by like have seven and a half seconds. So <laughs> I'll take that. And I was like, you know, I'm five, seven and she's six, two. So, you know, I should have oh, grown wow. my fingernails out a little she's bit tall. and yeah, really tall, really tall girl and um, woman. And, you know, and then I saw my time being 434. I was like, yep, that's going to do it for me. Uh, I'm going to be very, very happy with that time. And I'm going to celebrate like I just won and I'm going to take it all in. And um, yeah, I mean, it was definitely an out of body. The part that was so crazy, that, like, because Bob Bowman later in my career, because I couldn't like figure out the right words to explain it to people. So while I was swimming, I was like, I wasn't, I mean, 400 IM, let's be honest, like those just kill you. And they're like, no, they're not yeah. that fun. And um, <laughs> I was, I don't know. I just, I never felt tired. I felt like I could have kept going. Like it was like my taper was perfect. The moment was perfect. My suit was perfect. Like everything was just like perfect. And I felt like my legs were fresh. Like even when I got into like that last hundred of freestyle and, um, and later in my career, Bob Bowman explained it like, you know, you experience like an out of body experience, like can't even explain it. I never felt it before. I never felt it again after that moment. Um, it was just like everything just fired so right that day. And um, it was just like a surreal, a surreal moment to take in like all the adversity that I had the last four years and to walk out of the pool and be like, okay, first I just broke like my first uh, meters American record and just got my first silver medal. And and two, like what was a huge like honor or like what I was really flattered to hear was that, you know, the 400 IM for women's on the first day, first night and coaches and teammates told me like watching that race, like really fired them up for their swims. And I think, you know, like that hits you like right here, you know, it's like all the fields are like awesome. Like if I can inspire my teammates to go out there and put up an, an epic battle, like that's, that's pretty rad. That's pretty special. See, I, I managed to find footage of that race. Oh. And your your celebration after the race kind of it was reminded me of after Cody Miller won a bronze medal in the hundred oh. breaststroke. Oh, I love that. The guy. similar similar reaction. He was just so excited, over the moon. Yeah. Like, I I think especially in the U.S., there's a lot of focus on if you don't win a gold medal, it yep. doesn't matter. Exactly. And I'm like, even being in the Olympic final is just amazing. Thank you. Yes. I, yeah. yeah. I agree so much. I agree. And that's, you know, and that's what I love about Cody. Like he gets it, you know, it's like every moment, just take it in and celebrate your, you know, successes, even if it isn't a gold, even if it isn't a world record or, or like I get so upset when I see people that do break a world record or win gold and they're just like, hmm. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, celebrate. Like, that's insane. Like you're allowed to be happy. You're allowed to show emotions. Like I just feel like, you know, I've, I've been, done this before. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, it's like, you know, like embrace the moment that you're in. Like, that's what life's all about, these special moments. I, um, this is, this is a little bit, a little bit off topic, but I have a, I have a story to share okay. of at my conference championships for my college team last year, I was swimming the mile okay. and that was like the seventh time I'd swum the mile the whole season. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, and I'm right next to me is my teammate okay. and the whole race were like this. Oh, wow. He's about a body length behind me, and every time I flip, I'm looking at him. <laughs> and the, yeah, the, the last, like, 200 yards, he starts running me down. Oh, no. Split 27 on the last 50. <laughs> beat me by six one hundredths of a second. <laughs> hey, Bobby, thank but I, you. <laughs> but I was so happy. Exactly. But I was so happy. Because, I mean, I dropped, like, 40 seconds for my best time. Wow. And it got us into the it got us into the top eight later on when the finals really happened. So I just, similar feeling of, like, I don't care that I got second. I, I got second yeah. to my teammate. I dropped time. Perfect. And, like, Good for you. I was, he pushed me the whole way. It was just sim similar, like, feeling to what you're describing is what, what happened for me in that race. I love that. I love hearing that. I think more people, you know, need to take that and, and embrace yeah. it. So, um, right, we got a couple more questions here. I'll try to, I'll try to be okay. quick because I know you got stuff to do. Um, so I want to, I want to talk about your transition into Club Wolverine because at the time there wasn't really many professional swimming clubs. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, I'm curious if you can mention any, definitely not trying to steal sets from you to use at my own practices, <laughs> but I'm curious if you can mention any interesting or unique sets that you did with John or Banchik because oh, you God. talked about the 30 50s that you did 
and how grueling that was. Yeah, 3050s fly from a dive. I think they're all from the dive too. I think it was like crying by night number 14. <laughs> um, gosh, you know, it's so funny. I, um, I have this reputation within like my generation of like swimmers that, and especially my club coaches, like, I couldn't even tell you the sets we did. I never really paid attention. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you what the intervals were. Um, I it just, I don't know. I just got in and did what I was supposed to do. I remember in my club days, I mean, I know you talked about Club Wolverine, but we used to always do nine, 400 IMs, like on Saturday, three hour workouts. And I was like, scarred, just scarred for that. Oh. <laughs> um, but at, at Club Wolverine, we did the 3050s a lot. And we used to always do 2100s best average. And it was like, oh, we had to do it like monthly, even maybe twice a month. And it was just like, Ugh. Um, but between John and Bob, I mean, they, they always found some good ones for us, <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, but I feel so, like, terrible. Like, first of all, it's a long time for me now. And, like, even when I was swimming, I'm like, I couldn't even tell you what we did. We just trained really, really hard. Um, and You've blocked I, out the memory. <laughs> I, I mean, it was, it, was, it was like my way of healing. I'm like, just remember the good times and the good teammates and the good laughter. <laughs> but, um, I mean, speaking of John, I mean... Oh gosh, that guy's in my heart. I just, I just feel so fortunate that I got to have so many memories with John and um, just a true legend and icon for our sport. And I just, I could just go on and on about him. And I feel like so many people feel the same way about him. And I think it just speaks to all, you know, all the incredible mentors, leaders, um, coaches that, and just athletes that we do have in our sport. I think we really do have a special sport with really um, incredible people. I just think there's a lot of good humans in the sport of swimming. I I've def I definitely agree with you on that. In in the amount of time that I've been running a podcast like this, it's obviously been kind of difficult to get interviews because I'm just one guy running a tiny YouTube channel just trying to I talk about it. swimming. I but it. um, I ran into Nathan Adrian at a swim meet. Okay. And I, I took a picture with him. I was saying hi to him, and I'm like, I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity. Good for you. I, and a week later, I was interviewing him, and he's just such a nice so guy. Nice. So nice. He's such a pure person. Like Yes, 100%. It's a perfect example of just really good quality people. He, he told me mid-interview that there was questions I was asking him that he'd never been asked before, and I'm just sitting there like, all right. One of my personal <laughs> heroes just gave me a big call. I'm just going to act normal. And done. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I got, I got a couple more questions here. So, in 2008, you, you said that that was it. You knew that was it. You were going to be done after that year. Yeah. Was there a bittersweet feeling after your last race? Did you wish that you had committed to more? Did you want to do more? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was, Fair enough. I, mean, I honestly not in that time. Like in yeah. 2008, when I went to trials, I was just coming off of a terrible knee injury. I was so sick. I had never been so sick before. I was still on antibiotics when I went to the trials. Um, honestly, I was just going to trials because I wanted to know my last swim meet. I wanted to experience my last swim meet. Like I could have easily just like not even gone and been like, okay, I'm done. Um, so going to that meet is more of just to you know take it in. This is what you had been going training for you know i was really trying to make my third olympic team um but when i it was actually the 200 i am i feel like it was my last race and i just kind of got to like i was just qualifying you know live to fight another day you know i didn't even think i would make semis and, and i made semis and i was like oh there's no way i'll make finals and then i get eighth and i make it to finals and i was like oh i never thought i'd even be here and you know, I had such amazing support from, again, just talking about how supportive the swimming community was, like people that weren't even my coaches and people that were competitors. They're like, you know, Caitlin, if anybody can do this, you can do it. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys are so nice, but there's no way I'm making this <laughs> team. Like, I'm very realistic. Like, you can't go out there, like, on your C game and going to, you know, make our Olympic team. We're just too good. We're just too strong. And, you know, I can't beat Katie Hoff or Natalie Coughlin, you know, coming off of this, you know, injury and illnesses that I've had. And, um, so when I saw the tuner I am and I, and I did get eight, you know, it was a really, um, it was a very bittersweet moment because I was really happy to be done, but obviously it's not the terms I wanted to be done. Um, but Natalie came over and she, you know, she swam over to me in the pool and we got to take in that last moment together. And I was like one of the first, or I was one of the last people, I was the last person that got out of the pool after that race. And 
got a little standing ov- ov- ovation by like the part <laughs> of the pool that I got. And I like, that was like, I was like, wait for me. I just got, it. you know, <laughs> like, you. I was like, where's Katie, you know, and um, where's Natalie? And that meant a lot. Like that really, really meant a lot. And then, you know, when I was going to walk off the pool deck, like NBC pulled me like for like a retirement interview. And I was like, oh man, I wasn't ready for this, you know, like tears. And, but those were like bittersweet tears. Um, And then after that, I was like, oh, I'm so good. Like, I just felt like a weight off my shoulders. You know, that last year was really tough on me for a lot of reasons. And um, I remember that, you know, my, my parents were there and I, I kind of made my middle sister fly out last minute. I'm like, I need you to come out here. I'm like, it's not because I think I'm making the team. Like, I just need you to be here with me. And um, she was like crying more than I was after I was done. And we had like a really cool retirement party that night. And, you know, I, it probably wasn't until like maybe even like four years later, like I was like, oh man, I wish I would have slammed a little bit longer. Like it, when I was done, like I was done and I was really okay with being done. Um, I think it was probably when those next Olympics came around, uh, that was London. And I actually went um, as a spectator and as a fan and as a supporter. And I was like, oh man, I wish I was here. I wish I was doing this, you know? And and then every once in a while, like I'll get in the pool from time to time. Like, gosh, you still feel pretty good. And now I'm like old. And I was like, oh, did I stop too soon? You know? Uh, but then when I think of all the training I did, I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. After, you know, I get out after 300 now. And I'm like, yeah, that was good. <laughs> I, um, I think the reactions that people had after your last race shows the like i guess the the type of person that you are and like how similar it is to like people like matt grievers who just uh-huh. swam his last race last year like I'd, I'd put you guys almost on the same level of just oh, thank you i don't think there's anybody who's met you that hasn't not had like a positive experience Thank you. You just gave me the goosebumps. That means a lot. <laughs> really, that means so much. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, of course. Um, and building off of that, I'm, I mean, we've we've been the swimming community has just been blessed to have you sticking around. Aww. To have you still be an active part of the sport has just been fantastic. Yeah. So I'm curious in the 14 years since I know that's a that's a big number, but in the in the 14 <laughs> years since, what have been some of your best memories and especially competing for Team USA, like, just what, what have been some of the most positive memories you've had in the sport competing and then after being an ambassador for the sport? Oh, those are great questions. Um, I think while swimming any time that you could put a, a cap on, that's the American flag with your name on it, I mean, it doesn't get much better <laughs> than that. I mean, that part's pretty um, surreal, rewarding. It's a huge honor. Uh, so any international team I've been on, um, those traveling the world, I mean, I literally got to travel the world and swim. Like, that's pretty surreal. Um, and then getting to do it with ISL, too, again, it's just like, that's pretty amazing. Um, you know, my Olympic memories will always mean so much to me, but it's more like my roommate and the stories that I share and, and the, the women that I met and the men. And, you know, it's like, I just saw Maritza Karaya, like, you know, at the beginning of summer and she was one of my sweet mates in the Olympic games. It's like, that is like a sisterhood that you can't just, you almost can't even explain. And I don't, I sadly don't get to see her a lot, but when I do, it's just like, boom, you know, and it's those type of relationships and that camaraderie and those um, it's just a really special bond. Um, So I would say any of those trips that I got to experience representing team USA, definitely a highlight of my career. And then, um, the 14 years I've been done, <laughs> honestly, the, the event that I just did with Maritza, um, what was that? Oh, it was in J- July, um, you know, we um, got to be a part of a really cool event with Sigma Gamma Rho and um, the USA Swimming Partners up with them. And it's about encouraging swimming and s- swim lessons and learning how to swim in the black community and to break that stereotype and bring more diversity to our sport. And I was just so honored to be there with Maritza and Colin Jones and and Natalie Hines. And it was a really amazing event Um, just to see the excitement and the encouragement to come on, like you can swim, you can do this just because your mom didn't know how to, or just because you didn't grow up with the pool, like let's break that stereotype. That was pretty special, but I have to say um, nothing. And even to this day, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is sometimes I think it's even cooler than swimming in the trials. Uh, being able to be the Olympic trials host with Brendan Hansen, the last two Olympic trials, 
I had like literally the time of my life. Like you guys definitely looked like you were having fun. Oh gosh. <laughs> I mean, if I could do that every summer, I'd be like, put me in coach. Like <laughs> that was something surreal. And like, honestly, like the first time I did it, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't even know what I was really doing. And then I was like, Oh wow. Okay. This is way more involved than I thought. <laughs> and I couldn't even sleep the night before. I was like, I was like more nervous to be like the host girl than to be a competitor. And then when I got to come back last year, I was like, oh, this, okay, this isn't my first rodeo. And just being able to click with Brendan and that, those are, that was, it's really cool. Trials is so cool. <laughs> so, um, before, before we go, I'm, this is, this is your time. Oh. If you've got something that you want to promote, if you, any, it could, you could even just plug your Instagram. Oh. <laughs> if, if there's anything that you want to promote, whether it be a sponsorship or just something you find cool. This is this is your time. <laughs> right now, uh, gosh, you know, I've actually been trying to be better about getting off the gram a little bit. You know, I just feel uh, I want to be more present and, and be more invested in my relationships. So, I mean, I'm still on Instagram for sure. Um, but, you know, right now, if I could just promote just kindness, I don't really have anything, sponsorships or anything to promote. I That's just a good thing to promote, kindness. Yeah, I just yeah. really wish people would just be nicer to each other and um, just I wish we could stand united more and, um, you know, here we are filming on Patriots Day 9-11 yeah. and, um, you know, it's just I, just, I just wish people would be nicer to each other right now. So I would like to promote kindness. <laughs> that is a worthy cause to promote. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I right. always um, yeah. would always love people to go check out the Jesse Reese Foundation, too. Yeah. And you can check that out on negu.org, N-E-G-U.org. I'll, I'll put the link for it in the description so people can, awesome. people can go there. Thank you. All right, this, this was this was awesome. Thank you so much. I know we went a little bit over no, the initial time it's that great. we planned. It's perfect. Thank you so much. You, you're yeah. wonderful. I wish you all the best. And thanks, thanks. for thinking of me. That's very, oh, yeah. very flattering and honored to get. Um, I've, to get I've been so lucky. Just that. I mean, I've been so lucky that people like you have even given me the time of day. Uh -huh.